थैंक यू प्रज्वल ओ स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्म स्वरूपिणी अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णाय ते नम श्रुति स्मृतिपुराणा आलय करुणाल नमा भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंक so this is the last session of this particular topic that we have been discussing nasadiya sutta so and after this we will begin a, a detailed discussion of uh, what might be called the most important and the most profound um, philosophical text in vedantic tradition especially in advaita vedanta tradition uh, certain important sutras of brahma sutras Uh, but today we are going to complete this nasadi suktam which i mentioned earlier it it comes in the rigveda samkhida the 10th mandala 129th suktam and those of you who already know there is no need to further uh, to explain this again uh, you know the entire rigveda rigveda samkhida is divided into 10 mandalas Ten sections. Each mandala uh, or section contains a number of hymns, which are called in Sanskrit suktam. Each hymn may have any number of verses called slokas. Now, in this particular uh, Nasadiya suktam, it's one of the shortest. It has got only seven verses, and we already discussed the first. five verses now we are going to discuss the 6th and 7th which in a way are considered to be among the most profound and beautiful examples of vedic poetry where the vedic poet is not saying something he is uh, asking some questions some fundamental questions some existential questions of the mystery of the universe its origin its nature who can and who knows who can know it and who knows it who can recognize it so very interesting it, he doesn't uh, give a conclusion but it doesn't uh, imply anything like agnosticism what he says is it beyond description so the ultimate answer to the question what is this existence the ultimate answer is a long silence so that's how the sukta the this poem the the poetical uh, masterpiece continues i mean the poet becomes silent is asking this question from where this universe emerged so em visrishti kutaha is last words from where did this emerge and then kaha janati who knows about it the ultimate answer is we can't say from where it emerged and we can't say who knows about it but you had to remember in the fourth mantra fourth verse he says sato bandhum asadi niravindan kriti pradeshya kavayo manisha it actually amounts to some kind of an answer to this fundamental question the the existential question of the origin of the universe or the mystery of the universe so the answer is So in in fact, is 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 Shankaracharya's uh, definition of that particular expression when it occurs in the Upanishadic, uh, literature means in the innermost being of all of us we can't say at the level of intellect or mind somewhere within ourselves we realize so the sages and saints went in search uh, of uh, of an answer for this question uh, i mean ka iyam visrishti so kuta iyam visrishti what is this creation visrishti mean visheshana srishti means this interesting mysterious universe what is it and from where did it emerge and who knows it so in the fourth mantra there is an implication here you know i mentioned this earlier 
കാമസ്തദഗ്രേസമവർത്തതാധി മനസോ രേത പ്രഥമം ജിതാസീർ സതോ ബന്ധും അസതി നിരവിന്ദൻ ഹൃദയ പ്രദേശ കവയോ മനീഷ ദ ഏൻഷ്യൻ സേജസ് ദേ ഡ്വൽ ഡീപ്പ് ഇൻടു ദേർ ഓൺ ഇന്നർ മോസ്റ്റ് ബീയിങ് ആൻഡ് ദെൻ ഫൈനലി ദേ റിയലൈസ്ഡ് ദേ റിയലൈസ്ഡ് ദി സുപ്രീം ട്രൂത്ത് വിച്ച് കെ നോട്ട് ബി ഡിഫൈൻഡ് ആസ് എൻ എംബെറിക്കൽ എക്സിസ്റ്റൻസ് or an empirical non existence which means it is a transcendental reality so it cannot be answered as is or is not a sat or asat it can only be realized within our hearts what it essentially tells us I mean, this atman was realized by the sages in their innermost hearts that is the implication of the fourth mantra but after this interestingly again the sage uh, um, he reaches a level of reverie and finally asks the question ko adva veda kaiha pravochit that comes in the, the sixth mantra kuda ajada kuda iyam visrishti this is very interesting kuda iyam visrishti from where did did, did this universe emerge and kaha kaha adha veda kaiha pravochit from where did it begin and who, who knows or who can know the supreme truth and then kuda ajada kuda yam bisrishti for what purpose what is the purpose of creation now remember it is very easy it would have been very easy for a vedic sage to say that god created this world in fact if you if you just uh, pay your attention to the fundamental questions asked by modern agnostics and atheists some of them nobel prize winning nobel laureates i don't want to mention the names here they often ask this question in, on international platforms if your god is so wonderful so powerful and then this is this terrible world is the result of his creation this all the world could god could create then you cannot credit that god with a great a lot of wisdom so interesting and then if the god had the wisdom and he created this world then he should be a terrible kind of god because why should there be problems in this world so many things the corona virus natural calamities all these if god had so so much of wisdom so much of power he could have created a much better world so this is main question and i tell you none of the established monotheistic religions whether popular hinduism monotheistic hinduism or any of the brahmic religions there no answer so the world is a world of uh, a mysterious uncertainties again it is not uh, a, a road leading to agnosticism the point is once we realize that this world as world is essentially impermanent then we don't worry too much about something that is impermanent so we look for something that is beyond this world so something that is permanent that is real and that goes beyond that transcends the is is not equation sat asat equation we have to remember at the beginning na sadasid na so no sadasid no here means actually is english no means <laughs> na that is na asadasid na sadasid so but in, in sanskrit in ancient sanskrit it can this na becomes no so in the beginning there was neither empirical existence no empirical non existence something that defines definition at empirical level kuda ajada kuda iyam visrishti arvang deva asya visajjanena ataku veda yad abhuva so it implies says that the after the world was created then only 
after several millions of years only, all the divine celestial beings came into existence. Of course, if you go to Sayana's commentary, you find Sayana is more earthly than actually the Ved what Vedic poets were. Sayana is a very down-to-earth, complete philosopher. So he, try, he tries to explain this on the concrete foundation of Advaita philosophy. So you feel it's much more intelligible. But Vedic poetry itself is not so easily intelligible. In fact, that itself is the power of the poet. The poet finishes, he completes his poetical reverie, a kind of poetical contemplation in a state of transcendental silence. So from whom did this world originate and who created this world? And he can at his will create or dissolve this universe. And the ultimate reality can be realized only when you transcend this is, is not equation. This is the essence of it. Now, I would like to explain this in the light of Sayana's commentary, because that uh, perhaps gives a much more earthly interpretation. And then I would like to uh, give an overall summary of the, of the, the melody of this uh, poetical uh, masterpiece. And then I shall uh, try to slowly introduce uh, the next very important book, which we are going to discuss for some time. It's the most profound, the most authentic uh, text in Vedantic tradition, and apparently uh, the most important philosophical work in Indian philosophical system. Now we will just uh, read some portions of the commentary by Sayanacharya. So Sayana writes, Sāsishti durviknyanityaha kadhva veda kaha purusha paramarthyana janadi. So who can understand the nature of this universe in, his, or in, in, in all its comprehensiveness? Kavaiva pravochat. And then, asmin loki prabhuyad. I mean, who could really understand this, all this universe in this it, from where this emerged. Iyam visishti bivitha bhuta bhaudhika bhoktra bhogya dirupena bhu prakaro drishyamana sushti kudaka kasma ubadana karana kuda ajada kasma chanimitta karana samanta prada bhuta. So you can see how a great poetical masterpiece uh, becomes a very, very simple uh, concept in the hands of a of a philosopher. Yem visisti kutah kahajanadi. These are two questions in the seventh, the sixth mantra, which continues in the seventh mantra. Who knows this mysterious universe? Because it means this mysterious universe is beyond empirical perception. And its nature also is a mystery. This is what the poet really wants to imply. Pasayana says, this universe of different elements in the form of experiencer and experiences, enjoyer and objects of enjoyment. So, Vividha, Buddha, Bhautiga, Bhoktra, Bhogyadrupena, Bhu Prabanchagara, the Shimana Sasti. So the commentator, I'm just giving an example of how a great philosopher uh, brings it down to the level of a philosophical concept. From where did this universe, which can be experienced in the form of different objects of enjoyment, and different people enjoying those objects of enjoyment, and also all these five elements. Kasma ubadana karanat, kasmacha nimitta karana. Ubadana karana means material cause. For example, 
Gold is a material cause of golden ornaments. Uh, a pot made of clay. If you analyze this, you understand the, the Upadana Karnam in, in Sanskrit language it means material cause is the, the, the soil or clay is the material cause of pots and pans made of clay. So what is the material cause? Nimitta Karnam is efficient cause, the pot maker. The one who man, makes jewelry is the efficient cause of different ornaments. And gold is the material cause. So what is the material cause of this universe? And who is the efficient cause of the universe? This is how Sayana brings it down to a philosophical concept. But you have to remember Vedic poetry is a, is a direct appeal, it's a direct attempt to explain what is beyond explanation. So this mystery is something which cannot be explained. If it is explained, it's no, more, no longer a mystery. So this world of multiple experiences, objects, we can't say from where it emerged and we can't say uh, what's the purpose behind what is nature? More or less, sometimes you find some of these poetical uh, imaginations very sim are very similar to some of the ideas you find in the uh, 19th century Victorian poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Keats, Wordsworth, and so on. You know, so uh, very often you can flashes of that, the beauty and the charm of a poet who uh, explores into the mystery of the of the unknown and the unknowable beauty and charm of this universe eda dubhayam samyak ko veda ko va vistarena vaktum shaknuya nanu deva ajananda so sayana the commentator asks he says for eda dubhayam samyak ko veda who and who understands these two uh, who knows these two mysteries one is that is uh, what is the material cause and what, what is the efficient cause? And then Deva Asya Bisad Janena Jagada Vyadadi Bhudur Bhudur Patehi Anandaram Arvar Chinaka Kudaka Bhuddha Sustehi Pascha Jadaha. Now remember, Sayana's commentary is so mindfully much bigger. I am just, I'm just selecting just a few sentences, expressions from Sayana focusing on certain aspects. Sayana has written a very huge, very elaborately on each of these seven mantras. So the commentary is quite extensive. So, yet, yet karana krishnam jagat ajayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayadayad
conceptually pradibhasiga empirically vyavaharika and the ultimate supreme reality is paramarthika now all the and also asat that means the absolute non existence something that is even intellectually inconceivable asat is called now remember all these ideas later led in the works of shankaracharya to two important concepts of the inexplicable one is brahman the other is maya or mithya it's so very interesting so in the entire vedantic literature vedantic philosophical literature you come across only two fundamental concepts one is what is the ultimate reality ultimate in the sense that which remains the same in the past present and future that is that transcends the limitations of time space and causation that that's not born because it always exists that never dies because it always exists that never grows decays or evolves because it doesn't change at all so that ultimate reality is brahman which is which is the same in the triple states of human awareness or consciousness i mean the waking state deep state deep sleep state and also in dream state we call it the jagrat avastha swapna avastha and susupti avastha I means the waking the dream and the deep sleep or dream dreamless sleep states the same so this is the only reality now the vedantic philosophers very much like the rigvedic fight is perplexed by the idea that what about the world in which we are living it is there but it is certainly not there in the same fashion after some time it changes if it is changing it is not non existent because though it is changing it is experienced but it is not absolute reality because it is not the same all the time it changes so that is something which defies which transcends with challenges your definition and description or even intellectual comprehension and they called it something like this the great wonder the great mystery the great inexplicable mahadbhuta anirvachaniya rupa shankaracharya pursin vivek chudamani it is mahad the great mystery the great wonder cannot be defined as absolute reality but it is certainly not absolutely unreal because we are part of it we experience it so these are two concepts that you find in vedanta one is maya or mithya which is also inexplicable non definable indescribable and brahman that is also indescribable non definable inexplicable but for two reasons brahman is beyond description because it's beyond any tools of perception or understanding or definition so sarva pramana avati it is beyond the tools of theory of knowledge beyond the tools of uh, epistemology this one important so it is supreme Brahm, uh, maya on the other hand it is really non existent but the moment you, the mean the, but so long as you don't realize its impermanent nature its changeability it is the only thing that you know so the world is uh, actually maya or mithya it is uh, it is uh, non eternal or impermanent and for that reason it is not absolute reality but it is perceived and we are part of it so it is not absolute unreality 
So where do you where do you place uh, place this world within the category of the indescribable? It is neither this nor that. Sankapya, sankapya, vyatmika, no, bhinnapya, vyatmika, vyatmika, no. Like that you find satnapya, asannapya, vyatmika, no. You find in the Vyagat Sudhamani, satna, asatna. So Shankaracharya say in the Vyagat Sudhamani, it is neither real in the absolute sense nor unreal in the absolute sense. So to some extent, this could be misunderstood. That is, uh, this world can be misunderstood to be the absolute reality for the person who and who experiences it. Well, let us say, for example, for a normal human being, he's not a philosopher. Suppose you have in front of you a number of pots and pans made of clay. Somebody tells you, pots and pans are only different, uh, different forms of clay. And because they have different forms, they have to be called by different names. They have to be designated different names. So in that sense, they don't have an existence independent of the clay. So if a pot made of clay is sitting in front of you, it is only clay. And before uh, the pot maker uh, made, made this pot, they don't say it was clay. If it is broken, they don't say it is clay. So even if it is sitting in front of you and you pour a lot of water in the pot, then also it is clay. Clay with a new form and new name. Now, this may look ridiculous, but this is the, this is the reality of Vedanta or what we call Maya or Mithya. Now, to drive home this idea directly from here, we are going to another very important text. Technically, it's called Brahma Sutras. A Brahma here doesn't mean Brahman. Here, Brahma means Vedas. So, Veda is one of the uh, Vedas are the supreme facts, philosophically, spiritually, ethically, morally, in terms of authenticity. Vedas are the supreme testimony, the supreme authority for everything Hindu tradition, Veda, Vedic tradition, Indian tradition. If there's a conflict between Two books, some book writ written in recent times, suppose you, you see these temples, you know, normal monotheistic you know, temples, you know, they are performing puja and all that. So suppose uh, uh, there are two, three different temples and there are uh, different conflicts of opinion, the worship should be done this way or that way. So what they're supposed to do, they may not do all the time is, they should resolve the conflict or different, op different opinions by referring to what Veda state and uh, differences in terms of opinions or rituals, philosophical concepts that you find in Hindu tradition, Vedantic tradition, are all due to the differences at the level of not Vedas, at the level of constitutional books called Smriti. So, so this will give you an explanation. If you look at the Hindu canon, Vedanti, Hindu philosophical canon, there are three categories of canons or canonical literature. One is the Vedas. Another, ve another word for Vedas is Sruti. Sruti actually means something that you learn by hearing, not just by reading. So there are diff different definitions of this. Sruti's or Vedas. Yes, yes, R U T I or yes, R U T I. Sruti or Vedas. Different definitions depend upon different schools of philosophers. The Mimamskas, the ritual, ritualists will tell you Amanaya di Buddhisri Dharma Anayana di Amanaya. Amanaya is another synonym for Vedas. So a book which teaches us about dharma, about practices, rituals, performance of different rituals. That's the meaning of dharma here. That is Amnaya or Veda. But Shankaracharya will say, Brahmadinam Paramatmanam Labhanda Idi Veda. Books from which you understand about absolute reality, that is Veda. 
So, because Shankaracharya considered Upanishads are the supreme authority, so the most precious, the most important, the gist of Vedas, according to Shankaracharya, is Vedanta or Upanishads, which teach you about the universal spiritual oneness of existence, the unity and oneness of existence. It is about Advaita Vedanta. So, whenever there is a conflict between Vedas and other books, you have to listen to what the Vedas say. So, uh, in fact, there are different uh, verses uh, which describe this, which uh, they reveal this supreme authority of the Vedas. So, this Mudhi Virode Su, Sri Dreva Diri Yasi, Avirode to Sudaka, Rim Smartam by the Gavar Sada, Visi Java Lasmadi. Uh, and then, so this Mudhi Burana, Virodo, Eter, the Sire Tatra Sodam, Pramanam, Sia, Tayoda, this Mudhi Varivyasa Smadi. Yeah, this Tam Hive, they should the Dustavim Smudokila, Ubabiam, yet not the Stavim Tat Burane Shuka did this, so this Mudhi. So this Mudhi Purana is to be the Parasparam Puram Puram Yadi Beliyasya Yadi Jnana Vido Vidhu Nyaya Vido Vidhu There are different versions. This is from Abhastamba. This Abhastamba Smurdi. Smurdi means different constitutions. For example, you have US constitution, Indian constitution, uh, different constitutions of different countries in the world. So like that, in ancient India, there were 18 different books which were more like constitutions. Some of them have very elaborate interpretations of the principles of justice behind property succession, like for Yajnivakismudi with commentary with Akshara Jimudavakana. There are very important constitutional uh, masterpieces in ancient India. Anyway, I'm not going to, if you are interested, some of you may be constitutional experts, you can ask questions during interaction. It's a different subject. So the point is the supreme authority in Hindu Vedantic traditions, Vedas. So Brahma Sutra is called also Vedanta Sutras. It means Sutra means a pithy statement, a statement, very brief statement, Sutra. So Brahma Sutra means called. So Sutram can also mean a threat, but in, here it means a brief statement. As I'm going to repeat some of the sutras, we are going to discuss next week. They will understand what sutra implies. So the point is, Vedanta sutras are altogether the 554, 555, little difference here. Vedanta sutras. And this Vedanta sutras were written by Badrayana. And it had many commentaries. All the great Vedantic scholars have written commentaries. The most profound, the most authentic, and the earliest available existing commentary is by Shankaracharya from 8th century. This Vedanta Sutras or Brahma Sutras, same name, they are very ancient. And it is obvious from Shankaracharya's commentary, who refers to many other commentaries belonging to pre Shankarite times. It's obvious that there were many commentaries, but the most rewarding study is the study of Shankaracharya's commentary. Now, it may take several years for you to study the entire book, which I myself took several years. But what we are going to do in this context is to study four of these sutras. So remember, you know, we have got more than 500, 554 sutras, 54, 55. Some minor difference in terms of calculations. But anyway, of which we are going to study only four of them. But the greatness of Shankaracharya was that he condensed the whole world of Vedanta in his commentary on four of the first four sutras. That is Adhado Brahma Jignasa, Janmadi Shetaka, Shastra Yoni Tva Tattu Sumanayat. Four sutras, which actually deal with, for example, Jignasa, the desire to know why we should study Vedanta. And then 
what is his definition and why do we consider the scriptures as the authentic source and the harmony i mean how different vedic statements vedantic statements primarily upanishadic statements converts and harmonize i got convert, converts and harmonized synthesized in advaita vedanta i mean shankaracharya wants to show that in short all the important vedantic statements if you take them together they focus on one single idea of advaita vedanta which tells us the fundamental spiritual oneness a unity of existence so i don't mean the humanity the whole creation not in the creation itself is an incomplete very 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 inadequate very unsatisfactory word the whole existence is one spiritually and this is the central theme of advaita vedanta central theme of upanishads so it is this central theme that all the upanishad statements are trying to arrive at so these are the four sutras that we are going to discuss those who are interested we will okay we can also deal with other sutras of other chapters there are four important chapters we will discuss later so and these four sutras together are called chatusutri means something that contains four sutras four statements sutras are adhado brahma jignasa we discusses why if at all we should make an inquiry into the nature of brahman there are many things we can do in this world and incidentally you know when do we turn to something profound something spiritual something transcendental after all, when do you turn your attention to vedic poetry there are many sense many uh, uh, sensational things that you can listen to and you can get lost and go crazy wonderful things but instead of that why should we listen to this transcendental poetry of the vedas why should we meditate not with a definite purpose at empirical level but to reach a state where we won't feel any problem in this world i mean the very idea of problem itself doesn't occur how to reach that how to bring our mind to that state of spiritual tranquility and contentment and fulfillment for that we turn to the inquiry into the nature of brahman inquiry into the nature of the ultimate reality and for that we need some spiritual characteristics qualifications a sense of renunciation a sense of focus mental purity a, a, a strong urge to uphold what is real and a strong ability a determination to to disregard what what is non eternal what is against our spiritual progress and also a strong urge to reach the highest spiritual enlightenment moksha or liberation we'll describe this when we enter the text so actually when you knock at all the doors they don't open then you then only you have the feeling with the urge to knock at the right door after experimenting everything so it is impossible for anyone to turn to vedanta to turn to this ultimate inquiry particular the existential questions that described that we described in nasadi sutta only when we reach a level of spiritual evolution it could happen as part of our own evolution going through different cycles of birth life death and rebirth so that is one thing the second definition second is mantra is janmadi asya from word entire 
universal mantras. So it again, of course, it focuses on many mantras. Primarily, the mantra found in the in the Taittiriya Upanishad, you know, that is that is Varuni Vidya is called. Bhrugo Vai Varuni Varunam Pitaram Upasasara Adhigi Bhagavu Vramedi, etc. And then uh, Varuna explains to explain to his son, Bhrugu, this course is called Bhrugu Vai Varuni. He is a Varuni Vidya, it is called Taittiriya Upanishad. He comes in the Krishna Yajur Veda. Third one is Shast Shastra Yoni Tuad. That means Shastra means revealed scripture. This is uh, very interesting. This can create a lot of conflicts. Um, on the one hand, we, we, we argue that spiritual experience is ultimate uh, testimony. Uh, and on the other hand, we give importance to scriptures. So why do we re why do we give importance to scriptures? Scriptures which talk to us about ultimate questions of existence and spirituality can drive all the unnecessary chaff, all the filth and dirt and trash away from our mind and fill our mind with a lot of good ideas, good thoughts, good. Uh, uh, I mean, it can have the effect of purifying our mind. But to derive the correct meaning and implication from a spiritual classic, we should be ready for that. Means our mind should be ready for that. Actually, whatever book you read, we read, we'll be able to gather and understand only what our mind is ready to understand. So, if Sri Ramakrishna himself reads the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, he will understand much more than what we read and understand because his mind is at a higher level. So when we read a book, we understand only what our mind is ready and fit, mature enough to understand. This is an important thing. Then the fourth mantra is the supreme, is a very important one, Tattu Samanaya. So these are some of the examples of mantra. Of course, there are many other sutras. I told you hundreds of sutras. So that, that speaks of the fundamental harmony and the convergence of all the important statements of Vedanta on one central idea of the fundamental spiritual unity and oneness of existence. Now we can have interaction. So you can ask questions on what we already discussed, Nasadi Suktam, or we can ask, we, we want to know more about this new subject that we are going to discuss next week. You're most welcome. David, please go ahead. Please go ahead. David, are you ready? Yeah. Getting ready. Um, Swami, I have some questions about um, uh, were there only poets uh, in the Rig Veda era or were there philosophers um, uh, uh, who spoke more like with analysis and uh, that kind of intelligibility or were there were there only uh, poets in that era who had realized? There are many very powerful, very uh, um, articulate expressions of the highest philosophical truths. Right? They were. I took this example. Actually, if you look from a different angle, the Nasrathi Suktam is a very it's a profoundly philosophical it's idea, no doubt. It. Profoundly. So, uh, uh, mo most of these suktas, have, they contain very profound uh, ideas. And there were great thinkers and philosophers who were to find Rigveda. Rigvedic times, Rigveda Samhita proper, you don't hear about great philosophers like Janaga, Ashwapati, these are the philosopher kings whom you read about in the Upanishad literature, Brihuda, Nigala, Kuchandra, also you find. But Rigveda Samhita proper, you don't find about big assemblies or discussions are being held on Debates are going on, profound philosophical concepts. You don't find in the, in the 
in the, in the Samkhita, Rigveda Samkhita, you don't find that. Yeah. You, you don't find it, but they did exist. They just didn't get recorded. Yeah, yeah you know, um, of course, you know, some of the uh, some of the sages mentioned in the Vasistha, Vishwamitra, and even this uh, uh, Prajapati, they're certainly great philosophers. Yeah, they're great philosophers. Probably Shamita himself, who is the uh, exponent of Gayatri, which is a very profound philosophical place, he, he belongs to the Vedic times. Mm -hmm. Many Quite few. Yeah. Many. Okay, thank you, sir. Maharaj, um, how did the, how does the uh, rhythm. That's what the. Sorry. I'll continue. How does the rhythm of the Sanskrit language, um, how does that support the meaning in the Nasadiya Sutra? Oh, you, you mean how the rhythm, you're talking about the... No, I don't mean rhythm, I mean the, I mean the prosody. How does the poetic meter uh, in the um, in the Sanskrit language, support the meaning. You 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 made reference to that, and 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 I thought you might uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, you know, Tristup is the meter here, so uh, it's a short poem. So so you find this, for example, last mantra. If you take, I already explained this last mantra. Sorry, sorry some. Paper weight fell, but uh, it's a small thing. So if you look, look at this uh, mantra, you find, for example, uh, the last mantra. Iyam uh, visustihi ko adhva. Now, very small physics statements. So uh, more, relatively short lines compared to Purusha Suttam and elsewhere. So the brevity of the statements uh, sharpen the philosophical focus. For example, uh, the brevity of the statement, uh, simple statements, yam vishuti kutaha means, this mysterious universe from where this comes. You find many other Vedic poems much more elaborate. When they become too elaborate, the sharpness of expression uh, decreases. So, uh, so, so that you can find. So the, I mean, the brevity of expression is a very, very short, relatively short. In some of the suktams of God, you know, more than 100, 190 sutras in the last one, I come into Sutta, Rukhveda, Samhita, will be so, so long. But this is very brief. So the brevity itself sharpens the mode of expression of philosophical ideas. And also Trishtub meter, Trishtub chanda is also helpful very being brief relative. The, the Trishtub um, is interesting because um, the, the expressions are, are pithy and, and, and brief and focused, yeah. but the count yeah. is longer. So yes. I, I found it interesting that the actual uh, metrical count is is not brief, but the phrases within the count are brief. Yeah. Express it as sharp. See, see, na sadasi, no sadasi. So that's from so uh, neither non-existence nor existence. So you can find. Uh, Again, there is no real verb here. I see this of a verb. But at that time, uh, at that time, it's not clearly mentioned here. So, Sayana has to come to your rescue. Sustehe Prak. Before. Before the beginning of the beginning. Before the beginning of the beginning. That's what it actually implies. So, Sayana has to write so elaborately. Sayana's commentary. Uh, it takes long time for it. very, very elaborate, each of these mantras. So, Tadhanim is one word. Vasayana says, you know, 
भूत भव्य प्रपंच प्रपंच से सृष्टे प्राक यू कैन इमेजिन सो दिस वर्ल्ड मीन बिफोर द बिगिनिंग ऑफ द बिगिनिंग ऑफ दिस वर्ल्ड ऑफ प्लुरैलिटी एंड दिस वर्ल्ड ऑफ डिफरेंट एलिमेंट्स सो the word tadani mean then that's a real meaning in sanskrit but then is explained so elaborate by sayana so when a commentator has to write so much to explain one word you know uh, see the before creation the poet doesn't say that is sayana's burden so tadani sustehi prak so that shows the sharpness and the the depth the philosophical depth of each expression this is i get behind it's an example of this yeah. thank you thank remember you. there are many earthly poetry earthly poetical pieces in rigveda samhita very very earthly but very profound at also you find many of the mantras you know dwa suparna soija sakhaya jashiva mi sukam but only one mantra which the the whole thing is again uh, repeated as part of mundaga uh, upanishad in the, which is atharvedya tradition so you find that the four lines which actually uh, right enough for shankaracharya to bring out a huge philosophical concept of jiva who is sitting like a bird sitting below who is going on eating good and bad fruit suffering and enjoying pain and pleasure slowly emerging climbing uh, the tree upward and finally reaching the the bird above so that means dwa suparna sayuja sakhaya samanam vriksham parishushyade tayor anya pipalam swadati anasnan anyo abhichakasi four lines that is enough for shankaracharya to bring out this huge um, commentary you know so you can find this i mean i, I mentioned this earlier uh, rigved uh, in during rigvedic age language had not evolved enough but philosophy had evolved much more than language so when thought and philosophy and spiritual concepts have so highly advanced and evolved the language was relatively primitive actually such uh, poems will be more forceful more loaded with meaning and implications so i should also remind you that many of the there, there, there are many um, uh, ruks in rigveda samhita which are very earthly talk about uh, cow herd going uh, leaving the cows for grazing in the forest and they returning again like that there are many such the old pastoral culture of ancient india where people mostly lived by grazing cows that is also there this also is there यदा यदा समुद्रे नामरूपे विहाय तथा नाम विमुक्त परात परम पुरुषम वैदि दिव्य ऑल द रिवर्स दे ओरिजिनेट यू नो दे 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 ओरिजिनेट फ्रॉम क्लाउड्स रेन्स देन दे दे फ्लो इन डिफरेंट डिरेक्शंस बट व्हेन दे रीच द ओशन दे ट्रांसेंड देयर प्लुरैलिटी इन टर्म्स ऑफ नेम्स एंड फॉर्म्स यू नो so yadha nadhya syantamana samudre astang gachanti nama rupe vikaya so when they reach when they reach the destination ocean then you know nama rupe vikaya they give up they give up they renounce the plurality in, in terms of names and forms tatha nama rupa vimukta parat param purusham ubayadi divya like that a spiritual teach a spiritual aspirant when he reaches the highest level of enlightenment he uh, leave behind the plurality of names and forms so in four lines which more profound than nasadi actually so the first mantra comes in the form of asivami yasukta the suvarna in in the rigveda samhita but uh, in the mundaka upanishad one more line is one more sloka is extended as to complete the name so that's a supreme example so the power of uh, rustic poet the language is rustic primitive but ideas are grand and great on the other hand you think of the opposite yeah extremely well developed language 
but ideas are very primitive then you write a huge book which practically not worth reading which won't inspire anyone so uh, you have uh, when language is highly evolved uh, as unfortunately the case in modern times ideas are very very primitive mostly highly confusing but rigvedic poets were they were struggling for language and words but same time the ideas were so profound i mentioned this earlier rigvedic grammar where vaidhika vyakaranam is called they have this idea that the same word can express and mean different things in different contexts and also in terms of the use the the person who uses that word okay thank you for the question thank you yeah. shri ram you are next thank you how much you mentioned that the rigveda samhita is comprised of 10 mandalas each mandala yeah. is comprised of of suktas Each sukta of shlokas is the rik. Is the word rik is another name for shloka. Excuse me. The word rik. Yeah, actually, you know, because I have to use that word. I didn't. I didn't use the word rik all the time. Rik is the Rigvedic term. Shloka is shloka strictly applies only to modern Sanskrit. Shloka has its own definitions, but for for simple understanding. But people, I cannot use the word "rick" all the time. It's a Sanskrit word. Sloga is much more. It's a verse in English translation. Rick doesn't have a translation like that. So I use the word "sloga" in place of "rick." That's all. Same thing. Okay. But the, the... Are always they follow the the rigid uh, discipline of meters. But sloga, the Sanskrit uh, ricks do not follow uh, those meters all the time. They are very irregular. The Vedic language is. Rigvedic language very very irregular, irregular in the sense the 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 the, the, the emerged long before Sanskrit language was grammatically standardized by Panini in the sixth or ninth century BC. So it's much more ancient. I mean the Rigveda Samhita, the Aranyaka and Brahmana, they are all besides the Samhita. They come later in time. They came. Chronologically, they came later, or I Rigveda. There are many meters. Rigveda. So, so I am talking about the Rigveda. So you said the Samhita is comprised of ten mandalas. Mandalas are comprised of suktas and riks. Rik yeah. is the lowest unit. What about the the uh, rik? Some the uh, Aranyaka and Brahmana. Aranyaka and Brahmanas can be sometimes in through entirely in prose. It's it, the, some portions in 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 the form of poetry, but sometimes even mixed. So Aranyakas and Brahmanas are not entirely uh, in the in in the form of poetry. No, the long passages are so even Brahmadaranyaka and Chandogi. All the larger Upanishads are also they contain both poetry and also prose. But you'll find, it. yeah. Yes, sir. According to according to the specialists who study, uh, I mean, who make a study of these, for well, according to them, uh, we are talking about Upanishads, not Vedas. I mean, not Samhitas. The I mean, those Upanishads which contain both prose and poetry are somewhat older than Upanishads, which are exclusively in 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 poetic form. Like, For example, Kathopanishad is entirely poetic. So many like that. Mundugopanishad only poetic. But Brahmadarnika and Chandogya, you find both prose and uh, poetic forms coming together. Even poet poems are not entirely uh, regular. So they must be much more ancient than the Upanishads, which are exclusively in poetic meters. So the Upanishads came from the Aranyaka and Brahmanas, or they they are there in Samhita also. Excuse me. The Upanishad are they only in the Aranyaka and Brahmana or the Samhita as well? No, you see. All, remember, when you talk of Upanishad, there is also a problem. Some of the Upanishads are continuation or part of Brahmanas, and some of the Upanishads are part of Samhitas. So the exact demarcation. According to that's only possible conclusion we can reach. 
happened in the in the brain of Shankaracharya. So if you read uh, Ishavasya Upanishad, for example, he talks about Ishavasya Upanishad's connection with the Samkhita portions. No? So some the, the other part of the same text deal with karmas, but this man, this this part of the text has nothing to do with karmas. That's how Bhasha begins. On the other hand, if you look at Bhrigaranega, which also actually is Brahm, they have the characteristics of Brahmanas, but they're called Upanishads. So Shang, it is the only the safest way to uh, to conclude is uh, the demarcation from Samkhidas and Brahmanas on the on the one hand and Upanishads on the other must have happened in the brain of Shankaracharya. You can't say they may not have existed in distinct forms before mm -hmm. him because we don't have a, we have commentaries of Upanishads belonging to pre Shankaric times. Thank you, Dhamji. Pranam Swamiji. Swamiji Pranam, thank you, Bobby, for taking my question. I'm listening to you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Swamiji, uh, I consider myself to have barely scratched, not in scratch, touched the surface of our scriptures. Uh, however, what amazes me is with so many of our smritis, uh, Shrutis, Puranas, Samhitas, Sutras, and uh, the vast knowledge, body of knowledge which we have out there. I, I, I'm, I'm really amazed that there has not been any contradictory positions which uh, philosophers and critical thinkers have taken in terms of Advaita Vedanta. My uh, insight I would seek from you is, has anyone come across contradictory positions within Advaita Vedanta, uh, which negate uh, one position in, let's say, a Smriti to a Purana or to a Sutra, uh, which, which, which uh, clash with each other. And if so, if that happens, how is it handled and how is it uh, taken care of? You know, it is a basic principle in Vedantic tradition a Vedantic tradition means Vedanta, Vedantic traditions include seven schools of philosophers. Advaita, Vishta Advaita, Advaita, then Dvaita Advaita, then Shuddha Advaita, then um, of course, uh, Limbarka, Pallava, you know, Chaitanyas, and Abhinavagupta, so all together. You know. So the point is, it is a basic principle that whenever there's a contradiction or conflict between the views of the Upanishads, and abuse of some Smirdi's constitutions or Puranas written there. Okay. Then you have to uphold the views of the Vedas. This is a central principle. It's much more directly employed in a, during the performance of Yajnas and Yagas, where there will be conflicts, whether so many flowers should be put, whether it should be this side, the fire should be, altar should be this side or that side, whenever there's a conflict, then uh, they try to consult. But in modern times, you don't have that problem because the ethics are not so very commonplace in India. So those ideas with no, not practical relevance at that level. But philosophically, there is one thing more important, which you perhaps I should thank you for bringing up this idea. You know, most of the social injustices in India, in the society, like untouchability, casteism, or just exclu excluding a large number of people away from temple rituals. All this happened because they forgot the central principle that Vedas or Upanishads are the supreme authority, not Puranas or Smurdis. Because if you look at the Puranas and Smurdis, they're highly divisive. There are wonderful ideas in them, but they're highly divisive. So I can give you an example. When, in, when the Hindu code was being formulated in India, uh, I think Lord William Bentick was Indian British Viceroy. He called, he invited lots of Hindu Pandits and to discuss, uh, I mean, to, to bring ideas to perform the so-called Hindu code, Hindu law. And even before independence, in 19th century especially, Whenever there's a conflict involving temple 
temple properties and all that. They used to invite Sanskrit Pandits to decide. I mean, so they were very impartial. Uh, the British theory system was very impartial. I don't say all the time, but there were instances when all this happened. What I want to tell you is, and then in many cases, they pointed out that whenever there's a conflict, develop the Smritis, you discard them. You listen to Upanishads. It's an important thing to remember. But frequently, because in ancient society, going for going for 6,000, 7,000 years, a lot of old beliefs and practices are already crept in the society, not easy to reform. So what I mean to say, but another important thing is, you see, um, uh, the Upanishads don't talk about uh, different cults and groups. The Upanishads talk about our inquiry into truth and the realization of one supreme reality everywhere. So essentially you, what you find the Upanishads is a message of unity and oneness of humanity. Now, uh, all, the Vedic, uh, all the Vedic lawmakers were trying to uh, create codes and constitutions for their times so that the kings can implement these rules in society. But frequently, many of these ideas got corrupted and many of the power and wealth became the monopoly of the ruling classes. This frequently happens in all societies. Frequently, I tell you, why should you go that far? Till modern times, uh, the, you know, so a, a, no, no, an average Englishman won't be appointed to the state, to the office of the uh, state exchequer of uh, Great Britain, of the Supreme Court. Uh, the, or a man who is not a member of the House of Lords will not be even considered for that higher position. I'm talking, we are talking about modern times in modern democracies. This even after democracy system came into action. That's the greatness of America. For the first time, there was a constitution which really, at least on paper, in theory, did not make any distinction. So what I mean to say, all this happened in many ancient civilizations. This is a burden of ancient civilizations. I can, it, historically, I can tell you in modern times, Swami Vivekananda, who first pointed out this problem and this uh, deviation from the central authority of the Vedas. That is a running theme of Vivekananda's lectures in Colombo del Mora lectures. He strongly comes out heavily on the orthodoxy. So you can find the, Ve the Vedanta or the Upanishads also unifying, so harmonizing, but uh, not as much. But fortunately, I tell you, India's constitution is one of the most liberal constitutions in the world today, right now. All because because of the enlightened uh, members of the, the Constitution Assembly. And the, and the most learned and the chief of Indian constitutional experts who framed the Constitution was no less than Ambedkar, who, who came from a, from a society, from a community who was not allowed to go to temples. And he, he was the one who framed Indian Constitution. So, and it is so, so egalitarian, so democratic, and so broad-based. So, and that, that's, that, that, that's, the, that's the constitution of India today. So it is, we have traveled a long distance. Uh, in this light, uh, in this context, you can compare the, the place of American constitution, the history of constitutional evolution of humanity. It was a, a revolutionary document. I don't say, on that moment it came the law, it was really literally implemented, not at all. But a high standard was placed in front of you. So that's an important thing to remember. So today, today's India's constitution is one of the most broad based and even special privileges, reservations for the underprivileged, for the minorities which itself was pushed in the opposite direction, extreme point to, to provoke a, a backlash from the opposite side. I mean, so much of, uh, I mean, even uh, to the point of neglecting the majority, I mean, for the protection and special privilege and of the minority. So 
to that extent, Indian constitution became so liberal, so broad based, and it was framed by by a man whose community was not even allowed to go to temples, and he was proud of his great work. <laughs> so this man, Bobby, is, I'm very happy. Bobby is fully appreciated. Bobby is himself is a constitutional expert and also. Uh, Milstein, right. David <laughs> Milstein has his hand up even. Oh, yeah. So, yes. Swamiji, uh, so, so Swamiji, end of the day, it is... We have one of our, one of our American constitutional experts here. One yes. Of the top, uh, constitutional uh, expert country. Do you have something to add to this point, David? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, actually, you started the lecture with comments about why couldn't God have made a would make such an imperfect world. And it, it, we know from Vedanta that the answer to the question or the response should be, well, this is Maya, and we're encouraged not to um, to uh, to focus on our actions, not these questions. Um, and that religions regard uh, this question, the imperfect world, as a mystery. But my my question is, why? Because to sentient beings, this is a central question. And Vedanta and Hinduism supplies many answers. Uh, last week, we were talking about the origins of the universe. But this, uh, but why not this answer? Uh, why does it remain a mystery? Because uh, to people, especially someone in the justice business, um, it always attracts my attention. Could you repeat once more the focus on the... The focus point? is the God creating an imperfect world and, and that that is a mystery to us. And why, why ought that be a mystery? Why don't we have the answer to that? Yeah. I, there's no real answer because, you know, you have to... In a way, we have to go beyond the received creation doctrine to get an answer to this. Because the moment you conclude that God did create this world, um, I mean, the way it is described in the traditional scriptures, so long as that is our primary belief, we don't really get an answer to this question. So uh, one, I mean, Vedan the Vedantic idea that the divine is present everywhere, that is the only solid foundation for morality and ethics. Because true egalitarianism and equality can exist on, only on the basis of spiritual equality, spiritual oneness. And that may not be agreeable to creationists. You know. That's the main problem. Because the moment, the moment you talk about creation, how can the creator God exist in the thing that he created? How do you explain that? So I think um, so long as you accept creationism as the ultimate concept with regard to creation or humanity or existence, there is no real answer. Vedanta tells you that, interestingly, this Taitiri Upanishad is one of the Anupravishad. So a, a kind of Tadrishtva Tadeva Anupravishad. God created this world, then he entered into everything that he created. So the idea is the divine is present in everything that God created. God is present. If God is present, then we can't do anything wrong. Then the very idea of God creating an imperfect world doesn't arise. This is not, a, this is not an imperfect world. So if we can see divine everywhere, we can't hate anyone. We won't be hated by anyone. Then where is the room for accusing a God of creating an imperfect world? The world becomes a place for celebration because everywhere is done divine. You can find in Sri Ramakrishna's gospel, a highly enlightened sage came to the Dakshinesha temple. He was laughing, crying, and dancing and then he stood in the in front of the temple and he chanted a beautiful sanskrit hymn devotion hymn was always joyful 
So Sri Ramakrishna pointed out to his disciple, it's an example of the, the man and the highest realization. You're seeing divine, the divine everywhere. You ask him about the problems of the world, he won't see any, he won't be seeing any problem. So what we consider to be problems will be perceived differently from by, by an enlightened person. But remember, it is again a state of experience. But see if we can always understand that the divine is present everywhere, then there is no room for uh, complaint. In this empirical world, in the world of duties and responsibilities, and even your courtrooms, you may have to confront many things, many unpleasant things. Naturally, every, every noble uh, citizen who wants to do his duty will feel very, very a bit of a pain and sorrow seeing unfortunate things around. That's true. But behind all this, we should remember everything the same. That should not make us inactive or insensitive, but it is everything is God's play. In this love karma, rebirth, all these are will, will come into play different roles. It's important thing. So this is a state of spiritual experience. So once we remember that, that the divine is present everywhere in so many different forms, so many different names, there's no room for feeling unpleasant or <laughs> anything like that, you know? That's I mean, that's a Vedantic, there's only Vedantic answer one can get. If, I mean, at the creationist level, there's no real answer. It's a, it's a big dilemma that many people face when they confront men like Richard Dawkins. <laughs> In every debate, he's the winner because these, these uh, religious leaders go to him with their creationist doctrine. And they don't have an answer for that question. Why should your compassionate God create all this coronavirus and all that? There's no real answer. Earthquakes. So, so we don't give the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maharaj, I see there are hands up. I'm not sure if there are follow up questions. There's a comment on the YouTube. Bobby, David has a question. David is next. Another David. The other David who was on before. Very good, David. Go ahead, please. Uh, Swami, I have two two things. One is uh, just in response to uh, the the scientific sort of or mathematical reason is, I think, from Godel, who says that no no system can explain itself. Uh, so I think yeah. that that mathematically, you all always need postulates or axioms that are outside the system to explain any system, which is true mathematically and also with the, the universe and the world that, that that you can't understand that the universe from within the universe, according to Godel. No, that's true. You know, mathematics and physics will go together, but mathematics and life will not go together. And spiritual ideas are linked to our life and experiences. In life, two plus two may not be four in life. It's always four in mathematics, in physics. Because the logic of an input-output link you know, <laughs> doesn't exist in our life. You do a lot of great things, but you don't get back what you expect. Many wonderfully, wonderful Good human beings suffer. There, you don't find the two plus two four mathematics uh, law doesn't work here. So that's why we come to philosophy and Nasadiya Sukta and all that. So that's a big question that David put earlier, you know. Mm -hmm. So why? So this. That's why when you when you enter higher phys higher phil philosophy, then it doesn't violate the rules of logic and mathematics, but goes beyond them, transcends them. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, the poet in Nasudya Sutta, he doesn't give an answer. He gives an answer in the fourth mantra and fifth and sixth, seventh and sixth, sixth and seventh mantra, he will ask a question, who knows? Where did, it, where did, the, world, where did the world come? Who knows? I went, you know, there's incident. So on the one hand, it's a profound poetry. 
also profound philosophy. So that's the idea behind. The, 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 the sixth and seventh uh, verses conclude with these questions, the fundamental existential questions of the mystery of the universe and also human life. So he's actually, he's also perplexed by this, the contradiction, the paradox of uh, two plus two, not uh, meeting, <laughs> not coming together the way uh, they do in mathematics. In life, it doesn't happen. So maybe that's why it's called mystery. But then once you understand, once we realize that everything is a different expression of the same divine, then you don't see the other. You see only that one. I gave you the example of the great sage, white sage who came to the Exhinesha temple. You may read the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He was dancing. He was always smiling. And Sri Ramakrishna was should I, will I, am I going to become like this? <laughs> was that, was that the one? Disciple, could they to follow him? Oh, yes. Actually, uh, you remember that. Yes, so I that, think it was Fride who followed him. Eh? I think it was Fride who followed him and asked I him. They, followed him. they tried to drive him away by hmm? throwing stones, <laughs> but testing whether this man really deserves an answer. Could mm -hmm. they persist? Then he gave one answer. The moment you don't see any difference or distinction between the dirty water in the, in the gutter and the holy Ganga water, when you don't see any distinction, when you see the same, then only you have realized the supreme truth. And with that, it disappeared. Mm -hmm. So that's why I so you can see maybe the way they say didn't reach that far. <laughs> But he's asking, looking for answers in the empty void. So thank you for this very wonderful questions. And without your questions, I won't be able to explain things. So I'm going to begin uh, in the next uh, next session. I'm going to begin the discussion on some of these fundamental teachings of Vedanta, which is most profound and um, totally different from uh, Rigveda mantras because. Clear cut statements you find in Shankaracharya's comment. Very clear cut, absolutely no, no, I mean, nothing mysterious. So we are going to discuss that from the next session onwards. Thank you. Namaskar. Om Namaskar, Shanti, Shanti, Hari, Om Tat Sat, Sri Ramakrishna, Panamastu.